Also, Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman, Chief of Psychiatry at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center. Welcome. Thanks, Charlie. Is there such a thing as a panic attack in terms of the medical community? Help us understand, without treating this particular person and knowing everything you can know and not treating from a distance, but helping us understand how this kind of circumstance could happen. Well, panic attacks are a known diagnostic entity. Uh, it's called panic disorder, and they're associated with fulminant anxiety with a lot of physical symptoms associated. What this pilot suffered from was not a panic attack. That was the first word that was put out, but uh, the description of his behavior, the background and history are not consistent with that. There's really three categories of diagnoses to be considered without having the, ev the background of this uh, person and also uh, being able to evaluate them. The first is that he suffered a precipitous onset of a psychiatric disorder, a psychotic disorder where he broke with reality, he had delusional thoughts about imminent disaster. The second is that he had a neurologic event which compromised his brain function. In a 49-year-old man with no prior history, ostensibly, 12-year history of stable employment, um, to have a psychiatric illness of this severity so abruptly is very unusual. So one would think of a neurologic event. Is this the incipient manifestations of a tumor? Is it a mini stroke? Is it a seizure? Is it an infection or something like that? The third category has to do with intoxication by substances, either medicines he was prescribed by a doctor which he took in the wrong way, or he's self-medicating with something. Uh, what do you call the first one? The, the, the first would be a psychiatric disorder. Is, a but there's a name disorder. for that? It would be a psychotic disorder, most likely a manic or a psychotic mood disorder. And Charlie, Charlie, yes, go ahead. The, the, more than one passenger told us that as they wrestled him, he was foaming at the mouth. Yes. And we questioned him, is that indicative of one of yes. these three? Yes. There are several things about the description of his behavior which point you in the direction of one or two of these rather than the others. So he had stigmata of a organic process which would point to the neurologic or the drug intoxication. He was foaming at the mouth, he had hyperacusis, meaning he was sensitive to noise, there's too much noise, told the air traffic controller to keep it down. And the third thing is he ran out of the uh, cabin saying I need to splash water on my face, like he was having some tactile discomfort that he needed to cool down with, with water. These point to either it being a drug intoxication or some neurologic event. Um, a couple of questions that come up. I, I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, that we've heard much in the last couple of days as to what his state is right now. We haven't, correct? So we don't know if this is still ongoing. We haven't. And, and what the FBI people who talked to him at the airport said was his behavior was the same off the plane as it was on, right. which is they couldn't get a straight answer. He was rambling. He was incoherent. Um, now that he's in a hospital setting, we don't have access to that information. So if that was still going on, does that give you any further indication? Well, I think, first of all, this is a mystery just because we don't have enough information. But let me tell you, it's nothing that's going to take a long time to solve. They may, in the hospital, already know the basis of this problem and the diagnosis because all they have to do is do an examination, take a careful history, mm -hmm. run some laboratory tests and do a brain scan, and you've got the diagnosis. Without having that information, my... If you said, what is your guess, one thing that I noticed is that he apparently had been selling a uh, diet supplement. So one might infer that he was in some kind of nutritional program to lose weight or on some kind of diet. And in a lot of these nutraceutical substances, there are stimulants or when you go on a diet, you basically tamper with your brain chemistry. And this could have been a factor. So Let me make one quick question, John, quick. Yeah. Uh, has there been this kind of incident in the cockpit anywhere else in airline history? There have been a couple. In uh, an Air Canada flight from London to Toronto, they had to forcibly remove the co-pilot. This was uh, a couple of, 2008. In 1999, an Egypt Air co-pilot actually downed a plane, killing 217 people on board. And this was a guy that was under a lot of stress at the time. Thank you both. Still a lot to consider. Thank you. We should point out, too, that those charges come with a, a possible 20-year sentence and a $250,000 fine. John Miller, Dr. Lieberman, thanks.